I am so glad that you've chosen to join us for this 12-week journey in discipleship. We invite you to take a look at our gospel lesson for today from the book of Luke, the fourth chapter. So the devil led Jesus up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given to me, uh, over to me, and I will give it to anyone to whom I please. If you then will just worship me, it will all be yours. But Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord God and serve only him. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity to take this journey together as we consider what it means to be a disciple and follower of Jesus Christ. We pray that you inspire us by the words of your Holy Scripture, that we might be in a different place 12 weeks from now than what we are today. For he asks this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at our lesson for today, from uh, we're going to be taking a look at a lot of the book of Genesis for the basis of our lesson. And as we think about what it is that prevents us from growing in a deeper relationship with God, we have to look nowhere else than ourselves. For you see, everything that's been needed has been done for us by Jesus Christ but we often put stumbling blocks in front of our relationship with God. So and oftentimes God wants to just pour his showers of blessing on us and we take a tarp and put it over top of us and say, God, why aren't you blessing me? Well, it's not that God isn't doing his job. It's just that we have covered ourselves with this tarp and try to keep God out of our lives. You see, that's what this thing called sin does. Now, I know sin is not a very popular word to talk about. In fact, there are a lot of churches that don't even talk about sin. They call it something else. Maybe it's brokenness or something like that. And I don't care what you call it. But sin is a very real issue. Brokenness is a very real issue that divides us, that prevents us from getting together, that destroys the planet, destroys my relationship with you, and destroys my relationship with God, and prevents me from growing into a deeper relationship with Him. And so the first thing we need to acknowledge is that we are broken. We are sinful. Now, that is not the way we have been created. In fact, if you look at the book of Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 3, this is really a foundation theologically for who we are as people of God and what it means to be in relationship with God and with each other and with this planet. Now, when we look at this, you have to understand this is not a children's fairy tale. It's not like Grimm's fairy tale book. It's not simple children's stories, although the format of it may seem like they're simple stories. They are intended to give us an impression of some very deeply philosophical and theological things about our relationship with God and with each other. And the very first thing that the book of Genesis starts off with is that God is the one who's the creator of all things. And in fact, God placed humanity here and put inside of us, in verse, verse 26 to 27, it says, God put inside of each one of us the image of God. So that right away tells you who you are. You are the image of God. That's how you were created. You were created to be in equal relationship. And one of the fascinating things about this, this is a book written 4,000 years ago, in this case, in the book of Genesis. And they are talking about equality between men and women. So much for those uh, atheists who believe that the Bible talks about men being over top of women. Don't think so. Book of Genesis, right away, very first book, male and female are equal partners in creation, both created in the image of God, and this was something that was written 4,000 years ago. So we are created in the image of God, and we are therefore without sin, we are without brokenness. In fact, the Bible says that we are in shalom. We are at peace, we are at sync with one another and with God's planet and with God. So we can't use the excuse, well, you know, I made a mistake because I'm only human. I hate that excuse. To be human does not mean to be frail, faulty, filled with warts, broken. To be human means to be the image of God, beautiful in God's sight, powerful, creative, that's what it means to be the image of God. 
Now again, we go on to the story, Genesis chapter 3, and it talks about Adam and Eve. Adam, the word means the earth man, the man of dust. Eve means woman. They are prototypes of humanity. You're welcome to take them literally if you so choose, but I don't know any Jewish people by the name of Adam and Eve. They're smart enough to understand that these are prototype and prototypical words that refers to the man of dust, the woman that refers to all of us. So Adam and Eve, the man, the woman, they see a tree in the middle of the garden that is awesome and looks like they want to eat it. But God says, don't eat it because of the fruit and the knowledge of good and evil. And you're not ready for it. You're not mature enough for it. It's like a parent who puts a Corvette in their garage and stores it there until their 10-year-old is old enough to inherit that car. The parent isn't being cruel or vicious or unkind. The parent is just saying, well, when you're mature enough, when you're ready, this car is yours. That's what the fruit of the garden of, the, uh, of knowledge of good and evil is about. We were just toddlers. And God's saying, when you're ready, when you're mature enough, I will open up all the knowledge of the entire universe to you. But when you're toddlers and you have all the knowledge of the universe, and what are you going to do with it? Oh, I don't know, maybe create a nuclear bomb. See, that's what we do with knowledge. God knows that we weren't ready for the entire knowledge of the universe. And so God says, I don't want you to eat of this fruit. Now, please understand this. I told you it's not a children's story. It's not about the stupid piece of fruit. It's about our relationship with God, with each other, with this planet. And it's trying to define for us why things are broken and where the wheels came off. So Adam and Eve desired from this fruit to be like God. Imagine we no longer have to have anyone over top of us. We don't have to answer to anyone. We don't have to be part of the created order anymore. We can be like the creator. We have this two-year-old disease. It's I can do it all by myself-ism. I don't need anybody else. So you have a two-year-old, you know that's exactly what they do. And oftentimes it's funny, but imagine giving the knowledge of the universe to a two-year-old and imagine what type of destruction they can do with it if they're not mature enough to handle it. Because of sin, because of I can do it all by myself-ism, my desire to oppress you, that's what sin is. Sin is my desire to impose my will upon you you at your expense. I think that what it means to be God is for you to obey me. That's what sin is. That's why we can't just create a list. Sin is not just an arbitrary list that God writes up and puts in a book and says, do this, do this, don't do that, don't do that. That's stupid. That's for those who are immature in their walk with God. A mature person understands what sin truly is, it's not a thing on a list that we are supposed to do or not do. It's about my relationship with you, my relationship with God, and my relationship with the planet. And anything that destroys my relationship with you, God, or the planet is called what? Sin. And so oftentimes when you look at couples or relationships, we think of the big ticket items, murder. Well, yeah, that's kind of a sin. Adultery, yeah, that's kind of a sin. But adultery is not just about sexuality. In fact, I tell folks in their marriage counseling, hey, you know what, I committed adultery against my, my spouse, and they all their jaws drop. What? You did? And you're willing to confess that? I'm confessing to the entire congregation I have committed adultery against my spouse, not sexually. This is about 20 years ago, and I've probably done this many times since, but this one sticks out in the mind as my mind is one of the most horrific things I could do to my spouse. 
I was driving home after a hard days of work and my wife had to go to work herself. I hadn't seen her all day and I had three miles to talk to her in the car. I picked her up and drove her out to her place, to place of work. And I had the baseball game on because the Pirates were playing in Chicago that day. It was an afternoon game, beautiful day, and I'm listening to it. And my wife has all these things that she's got to talk about because she hasn't seen me all day. And so she kind of looks over at me because she starts to talk and... You know, there's something between us right now. It's called a baseball game. So I do the very kindly thing that a husband is supposed to do. I reach over my hand to the radio, and guess what I do? I, I, I turned it down. Oh, not off. I wasn't that smart. I'm pretty stupid sometimes. And she looked at me like this, like you wouldn't believe. And all of a sudden, I realized the error of my way. Because here... I'm going to give you a little bit of hint. This is free marriage counseling, after all, for those women. If there is a baseball game on or a football game on, and you're trying to talk to your spouse, he ain't listening to you. I am telling you. He's watching the game or listening to the game. I committed adultery against my wife for a stupid baseball game. I don't even remember whether the Pirates win or lost. Won or lost. You see, you can't define sin as just a bunch of arbitrary lists that we put together. Sin, not a sin. It's about my relationship when I impose my will upon you at your expense. My wife needed to list me to listen to her. She needed my heart and my ears that day. I committed adultery against her because I didn't give it to her. She didn't want it. She needed it. That's what sin is. So we have broken our relationship with God, with the planet. You don't have to look very far to see that, how we've destroyed God's planet. How many species of animals have gone extinct because of human behavior over the last 50 to 100 years? And what right do we have to cause the extinction of any animal? Who gave us that right? It wasn't God. We are told that we are to be good stewards of the planet, but it isn't ours to do with as we please. It's God's planet, and those are God's precious creatures. We should be the premier and forefront of the environmental movement as Christians. But we have broken our relationship with the planet because we've desired a bigger house. We are born into the sin. We are sinful by thought, word, and deed. We have broken relationships on a daily basis. Every time we cut in front of somebody and give them a finger, we've just broken our relationship with that person. Do you know what it feels like when you're driving down and somebody cuts in front of you and gives you the finger? It's like, what did they just do? What did I do? You don't even know that person, but it hurts, doesn't it? They've just broken their relationship with you or you've just broken it with them. Every day by thought, word, and deed by what we've done, by those things we should have done, could have done, and did not do. And there is a result of brokenness. There is a result of trying to impose my will upon you at your expense. And those things are, first of all, it leads to our physical death, the Bible says. That's why we physically die. But it also leads to broken relationship, as I indicated to you, with God, with God's planet, with, God's, with each other. And once we've broken a relationship, well, we'll come back to the minute, we live in shame, in embarrassment. There's no place in the kingdom of heaven for embarrassment or shame. But because of sin and brokenness, we carry these, carry these heavy burdens. We lead, it leads to us blaming each other. In, in the story of Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, after they've sinned by eating of this fruit and trying to pose their will upon each other, God comes and says, what have you done? And Adam says, well, it's that woman you gave me. And Eve says, well, it's not me. It's not my fault. It's that serpent you put in here. You see how they always want to pass the buck and blame somebody else. It leads to our perverted conscience. And we ultimately become slaves to sin. Make no mistake, there is no middle ground. You are either a slave to Jesus Christ or a slave to sin. For the Bible says, Do you not know that you, if you present yourself to anyone as an obedient slave, you are a slave of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads you to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? Whose slave do you want to be? 
Now this I can tell you, if you're a slave to your sin, to your brokenness, it is a burden that weighs you down, it destroys your relationship, it steals everything good from you. It is like a ton of bricks that you're carrying on your back and every time you put another pebble into that bag that you carry, you're weighed down even further. God wants you to be free of that. It's better to be a slave of God because God takes that, 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 that bushel full, that bag full of rocks you're carrying and just has you drop it right there at his altar. Let it go. In a relationship with God, there's no room for guilt and angst and all those rocks that you carry. And so God calls us to repentance. Now, please understand this. Your repentance doesn't earn you God's forgiveness. Prior to our discipleship class, we often go through a basic Christianity class where we talk about what it means to have a relationship with God. I don't want you to think that discipleship is the beginning point of your relationship with God. It's what God has done for you in Jesus Christ that is the beginning point of your relationship with God. This is all about your response to what God has done for you. So please do not make the mistake that I've forgotten you in this equation, Jesus Christ. That is the beginning point. But our repentance, while it doesn't earn us forgiveness, because forgiveness ultimately is a gift of God, uh, our sin does prevent us from receiving this gift. Again, it's like that tarp that we put over ourselves that keeps out the showers of blessing that God is trying to put upon us. We say, God, how come you're not blessing us? Take off the poncho, man, and receive a blessing of God. Repentance is the process of taking off that tarp, that poncho, so that we can be blessed by the showers from heaven. God is showering you right now, trust me. God wants to bless you. It's our attitude that prevents us from receiving it. Here's the thing. No matter how good you think you are, we have, by our brokenness, created a chasm between us and God that cannot be overcome by any human hands or works or actions, only the gift of Jesus Christ. It is the cross of Jesus Christ. See, here's what happened. I'm telling you. You know, God, God was up there in heaven and said, you know, when, when we sin, when we break a relationship with each other, uh, the, person, the, 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 the power of the relationship shifts, shifts to the person who has been hurt. It's called the principle of forgiveness. If I hurt you because I do something to hurt you, Basically now, you have the power to restore this broken relationship. And the same thing is true in my relationship with God. When I hurt you, I hurt God because you're, after, you're after all, one of God's kids. He loves you. And so God has to forgive me. And so what God does, see, God doesn't take a chair and stand up in heaven and yell down there, Hey, all you people down there, I forgive you. You know what God does? God speaks a word. Bam! I forgive you. I forgive you. I restore my relationship with you. And Jesus is born. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is God's word of love and forgiveness and restoration. So you don't have to do it. Boy, what a burden we have been relieved of. So we are called to repentance not to earn this gift of forgiveness, but it's a response to God's gift of forgiveness. Let me, let me illustrate this to you. There is an acquaintance of mine named Brennan Manning. Brennan was a Roman Catholic priest and alcoholic and kind of drank himself out of the priesthood. He got his life together and he started dating. Oh, what a new thing. He'd been a priest for many, many, many years and now he's dating. And of course, he didn't have many, uh, much etiquette about dating, a dating scene. He probably hadn't been on more than a handful of dates in his entire lifetime back when he was a teenager and that was many, many, many decades before. And so he's out with this very beautiful woman and they're out to a fancy restaurant and he's, 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 he's eating like he's always eaten when he was a single man as a priest and he, he, he grabs his fork and the plate's down here uh, by the table and he starts shoveling in his food and, 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 his, and his, wife, his girlfriend just kind of sits back in astonishment and shakes her head and she says, Brennan, can I tell you something? And Brennan looks up from his plate, huh? And she says, Brennan, your table manners are really gross. And Brennan looked at, at, at us and said, you know, that's when I realized how much she really loved me. You see, she wasn't asking him to change. 
She wasn't making him to change to have a relationship with him. That's what we often do. We're so manipulative in our relationships. I'll have a relationship with you if you do this. That's not the way of God. God says, I have a relationship with you regardless of what you do. But Brennan said, because she loved me despite my gross table manners, I realized that I wanted to change because I loved her so much. When you understand the great love that God has for you, the great extent to which God has done that you might have his love in your life through Jesus Christ, the speaking of the word of forgiveness that we crucified on a cross, when you realize that God would rather die for you than live without you, it is then you say, oh, I just want to please God. And so we repent, not because we have to to get to heaven. See, repentance is a gift of God. It's what we do as a result of his forgiveness and love for us. I hope you understand that's very important. So I repent because I no longer want to put that poncho over top of my head so the water from God keeps shedding off of me. I want to receive the blessings of God. And so we are told that we are called to repent or confess. And that's the first step in repenting. We confess that we're sinners. God, I've created brokenness of relationship. Oh, it's not by disobeying some obscure rules in the Old Testament. That's silly. That's for the immature person. You don't follow a list of rules and regulations in some, some obscure book of the Bible. That's not what, are, what the law is about. It's about relationships. Have you broken your relationship with your spouse today? You see, it's not the big items. It's not the adultery that breaks up most relationships. It's the little paper cuts, the day-by-day -day lack of consideration, the wounds that we perpetrate against one another that lead to broken relationships. Those are the things that we need to repent of. See, when I have a couple that comes to me for marriage counseling, I, I, don't, I, I don't think I've ever had a couple that's come to me and says, when they come up for marriage counseling and they're, they're considering divorcing, I, I very rarely, I don't think I've ever heard somebody come up to say, yeah, we're getting divorced because he cheated on me with another woman. I don't think that's ever happened. I'm not saying it doesn't, but nobody's ever come to me and made that confession. What they usually come to me is they, I say, well, how come you're getting, why do you want to get a divorce? And they say, because he stole the twink, last twink in the bread box. And you're like, huh? What? You stole the last twink in the bread box? You're getting a divorce because he took the last twink. Oh, it's not about the last twink in the bread box. It's about him taking the last twink in the bread box day after day after day, after day, for the last 20 years. Those little paper cuts, those little lack of consideration, me imposing my will upon you at your expense. We confess that I have created brokenness of relationship with God, with this planet, with my spouse, with each other. I repent. Now, I'm going to tell you what repentance is. Repentance is, I'm pointing this direction. By going in this direction, I created a heartache in my spouse's life. I turn 180 degrees and I go the opposite direction because I don't even want to come close to hurting her with that. So let's look at my illustration about committing adultery against my wife by listening to a radio uh, program about uh, the, the Pittsburgh Pirate game. It doesn't mean that I stop becoming a fan of the Pirates. Okay, what it means is if I'm going in this direction, I'm listening to the pirate game. When my wife needs to talk to me, it means whenever my wife needs to talk to me, instead of listening to the game, I turn my back on the game. That's what it means to repent. I turn my back on those things that created the heartache in my relationship. My third thing, so I confess, I, I broken relationships. I repent. I turn my back on those things that have caused that brokenness. I ask for forgiveness, forgiveness of my spouse. Will you please forgive me? Now, here's how we typically think of uh, apology goes. We say, oh, I apologize. All right, let's go on. That's not an apology. That's stupid. Here's an apology. I have broken my relationship with you. 
I know that this thing that I did caused you heartache and pain. I hope that you will forgive me. Oh, did you hear that word? I hope, will you please forgive me? I'm asking you for forgiveness. We don't ever ask for forgiveness. You want to know why? Because we're afraid the response will be. So, we're, so we don't ask. We just say, I apologize. That's not an apology. An apology is, will you forgive me? We risk being not forgiven when we ask that question. And I think that's often why we don't ask it. The last thing, we confess our sin. I've broken my relationship with you. I will not, I understand that this is the thing that caused you heartache and pain. Please forgive me. And then we go on to four. And then we live a new life in Christ. Let it go, all those burdens, all that guilt. See, once we have done this, we don't have to carry guilt and burden anymore. Oh, I can't believe I hurt you 50 years ago. You know, there's some people that will remind you every single day of everything that you did that was rotten. Thanks, Mom. No, I'm just kidding. My mom doesn't do that to me. But yes, some moms do. They always have a way of making you feel guilty about what you did 50 years ago. But that's not what Jesus does. Again, Jesus knows that we've been carrying that big bag of rocks with all those guilt and all those burdens. Jesus says, drop it at the altar. Don't carry it anymore. Just live your life like you're brand new and you're back in a relationship and in shalom with me again. That's what repentance is about. Look at this. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. We see everything has become new. Drop all those burdens, all that guilt. If you're carrying guilt, let it go, man. It's harming you. Once we have been forgiven, we can let go all of those burdens from our past. Now, I know you're still going to make some mistakes that harm other people. Well, you know, you have been sick after all. You've had a very bad virus or flu called sin. And it has infected you and you've had those puffy eyes and the running nose and you're in the process of getting well and so you're still sniffing a little bit and still hacking a little bit. I get it. You're in the process of getting well. But you are getting better. And yes, you're going to make some mistakes and you're going to cough in somebody's face or sneeze in somebody's face, whatever. You're going to do it daily. It's going to happen. You're a work in progress. I get it. So am I. But here's the cool thing about it. When we've made another mistake, we know what to do about it. We can go to God. We can go to the people we've hurt. We can let go of those burdens. And the great thing about a relationship with God, God is like that, 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 uh, that good girlfriend, that girlfriend of, of Brendan Manning I told you about, who looks at it and says, well, you know what? Your table manners are gross. Not expecting to change. I'm just making an observation. That's kind of what God does for us. God doesn't burden us with all those things that we still are, are failing or are mistaken in in our lives. God just is really patient and really, really cool about it. When it comes time, we're ready for it. God got to look down and say, okay, hey, you know what? Right, you know, your table manners are gross. Oh, okay, God, I didn't realize that. Thank you. And so I'm going to prove that because, man, I love you so much. The more we grow, the more sin that God reveals to us, the deeper our relationship with God gets because the more burdens that we can drop out of our lives. I'm going to ask you to use this week to do the following thing. If you are, have broken relationship with somebody, maybe it's a coworker, maybe you've been inconsiderate with a coworker or your spouse or your child in some way, Maybe, you know, you're one of those maniac drivers and you cut in front of people all the time and you give them the finger and you're like, ha, ha, ha. Do you know what it feels like when somebody does that to you? It hurts because they've broken a relationship with you. Remember that everybody we are called to be in shalom with, we are equal partners in this creation and in this planet. Repent. Go to them. Lay your burdens down and live a new life. Let us pray. Gracious God, I am just 
so excited about the new life that you want to give to us in Jesus Christ. But I know that my failure to acknowledge my sin, my desire to hold on to those things that would oppress and harm other people, is preventing me from really receiving the blessing of God in its fullness. And so, God, we come before you today acknowledging that we have broken a relationship with each other by imposing our will upon others at their own expense, my will on others at their own expense. And God, help me to find out what those things have done, where, where I've put other people in place, where I've harmed them, and, and to turn my back 180 degrees on that. And I'm sorry for those things. I hope that I can be forgiven so that I might live a new life in Jesus Christ. For it is in his precious name that I pray. Amen. God bless you.